Some little fairy maggot. How are you? Uh, oh, how, how very, very kind of you to ask. Welcome to episode 21 of the Blackadder podcast. Hello, Ian, you loathsome maggot. How are you? I'm not too bad, Jerry. How are you? That's very kind of you to ask. I'm okay. Maggots turn into butterflies, right? Not if they're stamped upon oh. or used as bait. Oh, that's unfortunate. Yeah. It feels a bit odd this week to be going back to the beginning. Yeah, we're travelling back in time to the, the much maligned and perhaps dreaded season one. Some people have asked us why we didn't start with season one. This is the reason. Well, we're, we're about to expand on it in great yeah. detail. We're ending with it. Well, no, we're not completely ending with it. Are we not? We've still got back and forth to do at the end of it. Oh yeah, so we have. Something to look forward to. Yeah, this is a, an odd season. Uh, you know, obviously the, the general opinion, I believe, is that it is not very good. And in fact, I think Ron Atkinson and Richard Curtis have admitted it as much. Although I I believe or fear there may well be some hipsters out there who think this gets a raw deal. Yes, yeah, it's, it's so bad, it's cult, I would imagine. Almost right. <laughs> yeah. Perhaps our opinions will be changed as we watch the episodes. Maybe it uh, will grow on us. Yeah, and I think when it was originally aired, obviously it didn't have the context of three superior subsequent series to frame it. So you just had to view it in its own merits. We're not able to do that, obviously, now. And it's been mentioned many times in documentaries. Had this been made today, and this was the first season, there's no chance they would have been given the time to rework it and come up with the season two, it would have been scrapped. They may not even let them finish the series, given what we've seen in this. Yeah. Uh, it just shows you. Well, yeah, it's something for all tastes, mm. I guess. Must admit, I don't think I would have let them, if I was the, the director general or whoever. Yeah, but I suppose maybe in those days there was an element of trust. If you knew if Richard Curtis maybe had a cache of goodwill with the BBC, maybe more inclined to let him continue his project, rather than a new writer maybe would have not been treated the same way. Yeah, well, he would have certainly had to cash in that goodwill. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. So as per usual, Ian, do you have a, a little scene setting for us? Can you transport us back in our minds? Yes, Okay. I do. Crack on. <laughs> so we're taking about a 500-year step back from the end of Blackadder Goes Forth from the trenches of World War I in the mid-20th century to the Wars of the Roses more specifically to the Battle of Bosworth Field, the last major battle of that conflict which took place in August 1485. History records that Richard III was killed during the course of the battle, that Henry VII's forces were triumphant and the Tudor dynasty began as the Plantagenets came to an end. For 300 years the battle was recorded and celebrated as a victory for good over evil, history having been written by the victors. If Henry's chroniclers could spread this fiction, What else falls into question? This is the premise with which the Black Adder begins, as we prepare to meet Edmund on the eve of battle. Thank you, Ian. Or should I say, thank you, Wikipedia. Mm, Not this time. Not this time, okay. (laughs) It's obvious from the outset in this season that there are larger production values and locations and sets than, than what we're used to. Yeah, I think we've talked about this in some of the other episodes that they, they for what they changed into season two, um, but we're, yeah, we're seeing here exteriors and bigger shots for certain. How do we begin this particular episode? Well, we begin with a bit of a, a voiceover and a, a scene setting history of its own. Yes, we're immediately told that King Henry the Seventh was a liar of Copernicus proportions. Yes, the, none. Uh, sorry, history has many great liars, but none quite so vile as the Tudor King Henry the Seventh. In what way did he rewrite this history? Well, the the proposition here is that he actually lost the Battle of Bosworth Field and Richard III was succeeded by Richard IV, who reigned for 13 glorious years. 
Mm-hmm. And presumably Henry thereafter succeeded him and changed the official history. Yes, and in fact, Richard III was not a murderous maniac who killed his own nephews. He was actually a, a kindly person who particularly cherished Richard, Duke of York, and he himself grew up to be a, a big strong boy and become king. <laughs> yes, and we're promised that we will also find out how Henry escaped the field of battle following his defeat. Mm -hmm. Now, I have to say that this, I think, highlights the problem with season one. We're given this this history lesson, this background, effectively explaining the jokes or the conceit. Yeah, so and, there's uh, multiple issues with this, isn't there? Yeah, I, mean, I think it can be summed up by saying they're, they're trying to be too smart. Or they are too smart is perhaps the problem. So they don't realise maybe that no, all the viewers... They, no, I think they do. That's why they've had to add in this this narration, this explanation. Yeah, but it's, it's not sharp. The, mm. I mean, the explanation is long, hard to follow. Mm -hmm. I mean, I paused it a few times. Oh, to yeah, keep I'm up trying to work out the fourth and the fifths and the Richards and the Henrys. Yeah. And it's... Yeah. Yeah, it was a, a slow and challenging way to open a comedy mm -hmm. show, I would say. Yeah. And there's also an assumption of certain knowledge. Definitely. Which not everybody will have. No. I think when you compare that to the succeeding seasons, there is an, a, a historical context and you'll get more from it if you do and know that history. However, you don't need that yeah, knowledge I mean, to appreciate the, the, the comedy of it. Compare this uh, rigmarole to... Blackadder 2, all you really need is Miranda Richardson dressed as Elizabeth the First, and you know exactly where it's set, when it's set, and the jokes follow from there. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the jokes themselves, they, they work in the, with, you know, without a larger context. Yes. I mean, it's funny on its own. Even, yes. if you, even if you know nothing, these people are funny. The, 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 the jokes and their personalities and how they interact are... Yeah. Amusing. It's not like it's funny because in real life Richard murdered his nephew on the well, Yeah. It's, it's a challenge. I'm all for a bit of history, but But I think even history buffs might find it challenging. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we, we segue into a, a familiar theme tune mm -hmm. which they've copied from Blackadder 2. So we should mention this was a cold open. Yes, the the, the preamble came without any warning other than mm -hmm. maybe a BBC logo. And it's obvious that this incarnation of Blackadder is, I think you can tell, is more snivelling than cunning. Even from the theme tune, mm -hmm. yeah. It's um, weedy. Yeah. You notice that when the credits come up, it's Atkinson and Brian Blessed who are top billed, mm -hmm. which is interesting compared to what we see later on. And particularly seeing as Blessed gets dropped at the end of this series. Mm -hmm. Dropped? Well, we'll get to that, I suppose, in about a month. The first scene is in the castle of Richard III. It's the 21st of August, 1485, we are informed. That fits with what I said, that's fine. Is that what you said? Something along those lines. <laughs> I think I said August, 1485. <laughs> We've forgotten already. <laughs> and that's the problem, you know, we're now been hit with it. It's like a history exam. These dates that you have to remember and... Yeah, yeah, it used to drive me nuts. In any case, a lively banquet is underway on the eve of the Battle of Bosworth Field. And Richard III stands and starts a, a motivational monologue with Now is the summer of our sweet content. Yeah, that'll play on the old Shakespeare there. And at this we get our first glimpse, as I mentioned a moment ago, of a, a weedy blackadder who stands alone to cheer and toast. Yeah, it's a very... It's emasculated, yeah. is that the right word? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's obviously not blackadder yet at this stage, just simple Edmund, Duke of Edinburgh. So insignificant is he that neither the king or his father knows who he is and have to ask if he is fighting with them the next day. Yes, Edmund's brother thankfully does know who he is and is able to point him out. <laughs> the king is then assured that Blackadder will be nowhere near him on the battlefield but instead will be mere arrow fodder. <laughs> Actually Edmund makes a joke about how he thinks he might just fight with the enemy but it doesn't go down particularly well. <laughs> no, it doesn't at all. That might actually be a high point in the episode. Yeah. And we then witness a more familiar trio. Although the dynamic is different from what we have come to expect. Percy, you see how the king picks me out for special greeting? No, my lord. I saw it, my lord. Ah, and what is your name, little fellow? My name is Baldrick, my lord. Ah. 
Then I shall call you... Bulbrick. I shall call you my lord. <laughs> I like the cut of your jib, young fellow, me lad. How would you like to be my squire in the battle tomorrow? It will be a great day tomorrow for we nobles. Well, not if we lose, Percy. If we lose, I'll be chopped to pieces. My arms will end up in Essex, my torso in Norfolk, and my genitalia stuck up a tree somewhere in Rutland. If you want the helm, my lord, we cannot lose. Well, we could if we wanted to. Ah, we won't, Percy. And I shall prove to all that I am a man. But you are a man, lord. But how shall it be proved, Percy? Well, they could look up that tree in Rutland. <laughs> Lord Percy is of the view that it will be a great day for the nobles. Mm -hmm. But Edmund's not so sure. He's not. He correctly observes that if they are to lose, he will be chopped into pieces. <laughs> and he proposes a toast. To whom? Well, it's more of a, a what. It's in the hope that everyone in armour remembers to pee before they put it on <laughs> tomorrow. Sensible precaution. Very wise. And we find ourselves at Bosworth Field, where after a bit of a declaration back and forth, the battle commences and we cut straight back to the castle. Where Edmund has slept in and is woken by his mother. Yes, along with Baldric, who is on the floor snuggling with a, a pig. There's also a man in a cage. Is that Percy? I presume so, because he joins them. And they rush off, they wake up and rush off to join the fight. So back to Bosworth Field. My note says they ride for some time. <laughs> <laughs> After a few wrong turns, they arrive. But Blackadder's confidence soon disappears as he witnesses the reality of battle and makes his excuses to, to leave. Well, I think perhaps he was deliberately making these wrong turns because he wasn't very keen on the battle in the first place. I thought he was just an idiot. No, that's possible. Either way, when, when they approach the battle, he is very scared and he suggests they just go home. Yeah. And we next see a victorious Richard III. He's dismounted and looking for his horse and happens across one tied to a tree. Yes, we should know that Edmund had made his excuses to leave Percy and Baldrick moments earlier. Um, I thought he was going back to the castle, but as it turns out, he was just relieving himself. The king is creeping around looking for his horse, comes across black adders. Yes. What happens? Well, he, he goes to untie the horse from the tree it's been attached to, which angers Edmund. Yes, to the extent where he lops off his head. Yes, and then unfortunately realises who it was. Yeah, his uncle. <laughs> yeah. He tries to resuscitate him, but without success. I think Baldrick helps at this yeah, point. the two of them work together. I think one of them puts the head back in place, <laughs> and the other one does the old CPR. So they decide to drag the body to a nearby hut. I, I think we can call it a cottage. I think we'll um, come to come to learn that's what it is. And inside this cottage, they find that they have forgotten the head. <laughs> but it's okay, because here comes Percy carrying the head, and he's got a bit of bravado about him. Yeah, he's boasting about having killed a nobleman. Yes, he's going to prove he's a man by showing this head to people to show he killed a nobleman. However, his desire to take credit for this deed soon turns to terror on discovery of who the victim actually is. Absolutely. So, they hide it in a barrel, just as who enters? Henry Tudor. Uh, they don't recognise him, and he stumbles in claiming all is lost. Yeah, he urges them to flee, and begs to be taken with them. Yes, and when they go to leave without him, he offers 10,000 sovereigns if they will look after him. Yeah, is that before or after Baldrick knocks him on the head? That's after, because he says that as they're going out the door, and Percy puts his head back round the door. Yeah, so they've, the other two have, have, have made a, uh, a run for it. Yeah. I think at the... The mention of the, the 10,000 sovereign. Yeah, Percy's head is turned. Just like Blackadder's uncle. <laughs> yes. Back at the castle, Edmund approaches his mother and says that the enemy Henry Tudor approaches the gates. Yeah, he is in a panic, obviously, but she seems more relaxed about things. Even the thought of being ravaged by the conquering army doesn't... Well, yeah, she hasn't had a bath, but she won't bother if she's going to be ravaged. <laughs> However, the troops storming the door are not who they expected. No, they're flying Richard's banner. Mm -hmm. It is in fact the king's brother who declares victory and wants to celebrate with the king and uh, a ravishing of his insatiable wife. Well, 
this is one of my favourite bits of the episode because the Queen says to the King, uh, says to Richard, sorry, I suppose now you want to ravish me. <laughs> and he's like, yes, yes, in a moment. The woman's insatiable. <laughs> I enjoyed that. She, however, passes on the news just given to her by Blackadder. Oh, yes. What a pity he's dead. <laughs> what? Well, who told you that? Well, Edmund. Is this true? Uh, well, I wouldn't know, really. I was nowhere near him at the time. I, I just heard from someone that he'd, uh, uh, I mean, I don't even know where he was killed. I was completely on the opposite side of the field. I was nowhere near the cottage. Not that it was a cottage. <laughs> it was a river. But that I wouldn't know, of course, because I wasn't there. But apparently some fool cut his head off, or at least killed him in some way, perhaps took an ear off or something. Yes, yes, in fact, I think he was only wounded. Ah, uh, or was that somebody else? Yes, I think it was. Why, well, he wasn't even wounded. Why did someone say he was dead? Yes! What? It's true, my lord. I stumbled on his body myself. Oh, pardon me, thou bleeding piece of earth. Listening to Edmund there makes me think of one of his descendants who would have shouted, Get on with it! No doubt. It's not hugely amusing, is it? No, the snivel. Well, you know, maybe it would be if it was done in moderation, but the constant snivelling and weaseling, the fact that, you know, he's one way in front of people, another way. In mm -hmm. private, I get it. We get that's the characterization. I suspect that maybe Ron Atkinson had worked on a character like this before Blackadder. Mr. Bean. Well, Mr. Bean comes after, obviously, yeah, and he's uh, got a lot of the same facial expressions. Mm -hmm. And I can't stand Mr. Bean, but I, yeah, I, I suspect this may be something that he is brought into this. Uh, he can't, I don't think he's developed this character for this story. I think what he lacks in comparison to what we've come to to love is the confidence because Blackadder is, is, is you know can be um devious and he can be self-centered and he can be quite nasty but he pulls off with that, that confidence and I think in this you know, it's not very attractive to have this no simpering little fool it, yeah there's nothing to root for no there's no joy in seeing him succeed or uh, schadenfreude in seeing him fail because he's just nothing really mm. I don't like him. No. Anyway, fortunately, they, referring back to the clip there, they don't think that it was Blackadder. No, they think Henry Tudor must have done it. Yeah. Blackadder eagerly agrees with this. Of course. And at this, his father is anointed king, King Richard IV, before he makes a speech and goes off to kill more prisoners. As you do. How else would you celebrate a promotion? Exactly. I think this might be Blackadder's chambers. Yeah, I've just noted his room. I think yeah. that's what I'll refer to it from now on. <laughs> the three conspirators creep into the three conspirators creep in and shout for joy at having gotten away with the, their story and Blackadder becoming a prince of the realm. Yeah, it's a successful regicide. And he immediately lets the thought of power go to his head but is taken down uh, a peg or two when Prince Harry enters looking to tally up the kills of the day. <laughs> yes, uh, Edmund once again weasels and simpers and lies essentially trying to take credit for things he didn't do. Yeah I think he comes up with a total of about 450 peasants. Yeah I mean it takes him a minute to realise that he's not being accused of killing the king. Yeah. And once he figures that, he then gets this unnecessary bravado and says, yeah, he killed 450 peasants and a whole list of nobles. Yeah, lords and bishops. I, th I think the Bishop of Bath and Wales. <laughs> he gets a name check. Yes, he does. Uh -huh. um, but I think at least one of the people he claims to have killed Harry says he killed himself. <laughs> and there's a bunch of others that were on their side and whatever else. Yeah. It's just ridiculous. Percy, on the other hand, is not asked for his score. His Blackadder has already let Harry know that he turned up late for the battle. Yes. <laughs> so Harry leaves and Blackadder is ready to relax when he opens the curtains to his bed to discover the dying Henry Tudor lying there. 
Who the hell is this? <laughs> ah, well, you remember that dying man we saw in the cottage? The one I specifically told you not to bring back to the castle under any circumstances? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's the one, yes. So what is he doing in my bed? Well, he claims to be a wealthy man. I thought if we nurse him back to health, he may reward us. Now, wait. I think I have an idea. If he is a wealthy man and we nurse him back to health, he may reward us. Oh, <laughs> brilliant, my lord. Very good thinking. Thank, Thank you, you Bordick. Well, what would you expect? After all, who has the fastest brain in the land? Prince Edmund, Duke of Edinburgh. Who is the boldest horseman in the land? Prince Edmund, Duke, Duke of, of Edinburgh. Edinburgh. Who is the bravest swordsman in the land? Oh, don't tell me that's that ill from Norfolk. Prince Edmund, Edmund Duke, Duke of Edinburgh. Precisely. Or, as I shall be known from now on, the Black Vegetable. <laughs> Baldrick has a... Uh... What appropriate suggestion. Yeah, he's going to go with Blackadder, I think. <laughs> this scene wasn't great, but it did put me in mind of some of the good stuff that came in Blackadder 2 with these same three people. Give me an example. So the Blackadder's chambers in Blackadder 2 when they're um, producing gold, mm -hmm. for example. In fact, there's quite a few in Blackadder 2. I'm not sure about all the mm -hmm. lists. There's no point in listing them all, but these three characters are better in Blackadder 2 for the new dynamic. I think Percy's the closest, mm. but he's still better in Blackadder 2. Yeah, I mean, I think he is in the middle. I mean, obviously Blackadder and Baldrick, they're effectively a role reversal moving forward. Yeah, and we noted, I think, when we did earlier podcasts, the difference between Percy and Blackadder, uh, Percy and Baldrick's different types of stupidity. Mm -hmm. But in this one, there's not really that same contrast. Percy's just mm. limp. Yeah. You know, there's nothing for him to contrast with. He's not, and you don't have the strong Blackadder character for him to bounce off as well. It's, it doesn't work as well in this um, arrangement as it does later. Mm -hmm. We then have a short montage where we see Blackadder choosing his new style of hair and clothing. Yeah, his new hair's terrible. It's, oh, it's horrible. Is that a little bowl cut? Some of the clothes are alright, but not all of them. The shoes were stupid. I like his shoes. <laughs> you wear shoes like that? <laughs> Occasionally. <laughs> We're in the corridor where Baldrick and Percy are now in full-on brown nose mode. Yeah, they praise Edmund for his wit, but he gets upset because they mention Richard III. Yeah, I think it's something to do with being head and shoulders above him. <laughs> so he sends them away. And inside the bedroom, he opens the curtains to the recovering Henry Tudor and asks if he is not better yet. I think he's getting a bit annoyed with him hanging around. Yeah, Edmund kind of thinks he might recognise him, not sure from where, but Henry finds out who Edmund is here and is particularly shocked. I didn't understand this. He would have known, surely. He's in a castle. He's just in a bed. He was maybe unconscious all the way till he got to the bed. At least he's his one room. You think, but... But then yeah, he's but, talking about being Duke of Edinburgh standing next to the bed in the uh -huh. previous scene. And how many uh, rooms or how many bedrooms back in that day would have had four poster beds? It's not who a, knows? It's not a little hut. It could have been a duchy or a yeah, uh, I suppose. In any case, he hides the fact that he recognises. Yes, he claims to be a very wealthy, modest person <laughs> who wishes to remain anonymous. At the hint that he's not rich, uh, Edmund immediately jumps on it, and he's um, well. I think corrected. he tells him. He, yeah, I think he tells him he better be rich and to get better and out of his bed before closing the curtains, and then trying on the crown that belonged to his uncle. Yes, at which point there's some brilliant CGI <laughs> as Richard III returns. Yes, we have a ghostly, blooded vision of the deceased. Who taunts him yes. mercilessly. <laughs> he does. And an understandably nervous Edna, <laughs> as we heard at the top of the podcast, yeah. tries to play it cool, but is having trouble hiding his fear, especially when he admits to being dead. I enjoyed the floaty head. Yeah. That was nicely done. It reminded me of Rent a Ghost. Seamless. Yeah. At this point, uh, Edmund's mother, uh, presumably now the Queen, arrives to fetch him for the banquet. Yeah, so she's outside and he has to keep her out by claiming to be with a man. 
Yes, but she thinks it's a sheep. <laughs> yes, because he hesitates. <laughs> She's so disappointed. Uh, the ghost then departs into pieces as Blackadder opens his door to his mother, who tells him to hurry up as he's late for this banquet. And as he does, we see the knight listening on from behind the curtains. Yes, and Blackadder urges his mother not to tell anybody that he slept in and missed the start of the battle. And she is sympathetic. Of course, I mean, she's not known for that type of thing. She hasn't mentioned his brother's fear of spoons or his dad's small genitalia. Exactly. She then walks over to the curtain and is about to reveal Henry Tudor before he saves the day how. He makes sheep noise. <laughs> and she leaves. She's very disappointed. Not yeah. that her son has been having a carnal relations with a, a, a sheep, but because of the lying. It's quite hurtful. It's very disappointing. She's <laughs> very disappointed. Down at the banquet. Yes, um... Edmund's father yells at him for trying to sit in the, the dead king's seat. Mm -hmm. And at this, the ghost reappears and Blackadder scurries off. Yes, but the ghost seems perplexed that nobody else can see him. Yeah, how do ghosts work? Do you know immediately you're a ghost? Are you... Well, he knows he's been killed. He knows his head's off. How would you know that? How do you know that he knows Because he that? says to Edmund that his head's off. Yeah. And then his head comes off and floats. That's true. But maybe he's in a bit of, you know, a state of shock. He's not thinking clearly. Yeah, he's not processed it. He's just become a ghost. <laughs> anyway, after talking across the frustrated ghost, the new king proceeds to stand and deliver a toast and to swear vengeance. Tonight, honoured friends, we are gathered to celebrate a great victory and to mourn a great loss. Mm. Yeah, yeah. A toast! To our triumph, our triumph. triumph, and I raise our royal cast upon the man who slew Richard, our noble king. It was him. Oh my God! Quiet at the end there. <laughs> Whoever it was. It was him, Edna. Wherever he be. He's down there at the end. He shall be struck down. Well then get on with it, you stupid oaf. He's there. It wasn't me. Who said that? The Edmund who killed me this afternoon. I didn't. Well then, who did? It was actually Edmund who interrupted, sire. Hang the little slug. Ah! I will have silence! <laughs> Another toast to dead King Richard. Oh, my God. Gentlemen. <laughs> oh, thank you, sir. Thank you all. Thank you very much for nothing. Thank you so much. That's the last you'll be seeing of me. Not that you've seen much of me in any Thereafter, the new king wants to proceed with a desecration. <laughs> and calls for the portrait of the great pretender, Henry Tudor. Edmund immediately recognises the face from the portrait and rushes out. He does. So up in the bedroom, he is met only by the ghost of his uncle, who is taking delight in the situation. He continues to taunt him. Henry, meanwhile, out the window, is escaping on horseback. Yeah, and so Blackadder gives chase. As Edmund rides, he enters a wooded area where he encounters three witches. I think so. It's, it's in dense fog, isn't it? Yeah, it's a sort of Macbeth reference. King Lear as well. So okay. Three, uh, three uh, daughters in King Lear, I think. Yeah. Cordelia and what have you, Condoro and somebody else. Maybe an amalgamation. I think so. He startles them. Mm -hmm. He's quite pleased, however, when these crones have a, a positive message for him. Yeah, they greet him as a ruler of men, ravisher of women and slayer of kings. Yeah, he will one day be king and they bow to his majesty as he bids goodbye to the snackletoothed vultures and rides off into a, a promising history. And we get the closing credits, which are similar again to Blackadder 2, mm -hmm. and then a post credit scene. Yeah, well, before we get to the, the post credit scene, um, I thought this was quite a weak end to an episode. It didn't really fit with any of the rest of the episode. No. But and that's the bit that it's titled for. Yeah, and, and there's normally a, you know, one big sort of set piece. And that scene wasn't funny. No. Other than the fact, well, they're predicting his, he's going to be king and he's yeah. being mean to them. I, I think I suppose if you look at it as this is the first episode, it's a set-up of what's to come. Yeah. It's a, a continuous tale. 
But we've come to expect a, a big joker, yeah. a big finish, and we didn't get it here, really. I think the Blackadder character in this is very familiar. It's the, the, I don't know if it's a trope, it's probably very real. The person who will stand up to those he sees as inferior to himself and cower from those yeah. that he sees as superior. But it's exaggerated to such an extent. I mean, he's cruel to these women mm -hmm. and sniveling like a baby in front of his father. It's just, mm -hmm. I don't know. I didn't, I didn't like it. No. Well, again, in fairness, I don't think he's meant to be a, a likable person, but... Yeah, but I didn't find it entertaining. No. That's the problem. It wasn't like... You didn't laugh at him. You didn't laugh with him. Definitely. Um, it's, it's certainly not. I mean, in seasons two, three, and four, there are so many quotable lines and scenes, you know, things that you would discuss in the playground, things that you'd want to watch again and again. I think in this episode, there's nothing that you think, oh, I'll need to... To rewind my VHS on this and let my mates know about it tomorrow. The thing I don't get, Rowan Atkinson obviously was highly regarded at this time. You know, a comedy genius, the the big thing coming out of Oxford University. And he is co-writing this and this is the lead role that he writes. Yeah. I said at the start, I mean, I think they're just trying to be too clever. Yeah. So anyway, sorry, tell me about this uh, post credit scene. Oh, it's back with these women who, it turns out, thought he was Henry Tudor. Yes. I think what they say is that uh, they thought Henry Tudor would be uh, better looking, less Jewish. Just like the man who rose, rode past earlier. Yeah. And then they realised their mistake. Oops. Hmm. And there we have it. Yeah, so, mm, yeah, I think we've summed up already our feelings on it. Not great. I mean, it might be somebody's favourite episode. Somebody who's deaf, maybe. If there is anyone <laughs> who has this as their favourite episode should be watched. The type who might end up becoming a serial killer. Yeah, or subscribing to YouTube videos with clips from Mrs. Brown's boys and stuff like that. <laughs> Keep them away from matches and, and animals. <laughs> Do you have a favourite line? Yeah, well, hmm, there weren't many great lines in it. I quite liked the uh, the black vegetable. I quite liked the exchange when the, the new king came back from the battle and the queen asked if he was going to ravish her. Hmm. And he said she was insatiable. <laughs> Particularly in the context of what we see in the next episode, which we'll get to in the next podcast. We will indeed. Some production information before we chat about the, the stars and any trivia we might have. So it was first broadcast on the 15th of June 1983. Slightly longer this season, I think about 35, 33, 35 minutes in length as opposed to the 28, 29 minutes we've been yeah. used to. And we also have a, a new director, or an old director. Yeah. Martin Shardlow. Now, there's not a lot of information out there about him, but he is reported to have died around December 2016. Around? Yeah, I don't have a, a date. It's unconfirmed. I think he sort of dropped off the... The radar. Radar and... So he either died or he's in the Bahamas somewhere. <laughs> he directed every episode of the first season and has also directed The Upper Hand, Little and Large, Terry and June. Are You Being Served, Smith & Jones, No Place Like Home, and Only Fools and Horses, including the pilot episode of that show. Trusted by Mr Rennick. Mm -hmm. When back in the day, he obviously was involved in some very high profile shows there. So. Yeah, well, those are some of the major sitcoms of the, the 90s and the mm -hmm. 80s. King Richard III was of course played by Peter Cook, who died in 1995, aged just 57. He's a comedy legend. Named the father of modern satire by The Guardian. He was ranked number one in the Comedian's Comedian poll of over 300 comics, writers, producers and directors from around the world. And creator of the, the four-man group Beyond the Fringe, which also contained the Dudley Moore, Jonathan Miller and the fabulous Alan Bennett. As an actor, he has been in Alice in Wonderland, The Rise and Rise of Michael Rimmer, The Hound of the Baskervilles. Derek and Clive get the horn, Yellowbeard, Supergirl, Without a Clue, Great the Balls of Fire and The Princess Bride. In TV, he has appeared in Not Only But Also. He was the voice of Roger Melly from The Viz Comics. And he has been in the comic strip Presents and The Two of Us, as well as many other things. He has performed in numerous Amnesty International shows, including the, the Secret Policeman's Ball, that was written by Billy Connolly and starred Ron Atkinson. 
He also performed numerous roles in the concept album Consequences from 1977, which I think he's now got cult status. And you might not know this, Ian, but he provided financial backing for the satirical magazine Private Eye. And his estate still has a 40% stake in it, I'm led to believe. It's quite interesting, isn't it? Hmm? I read somewhere that he appeared on a chat show or a radio show maybe with Clive Anderson and played four different characters. Yeah, so one. that's quite uh, quite famous, yeah. yeah. You'll get that on YouTube. It's uh, very funny. Yeah, maybe worth tuning into. Yeah, I mean, that was, I think that would have been early 90s. Early, early 90s to mid, yeah, yeah, so fairly well on, yeah. We'll have recognised the face and the voice of King Richard the Fourth. As that of uh, Brian and Blessed. He was born in 1936 and he is indeed known for his uh, booming voice. He is in all six episodes of season one, as well as being in The Three Musketeers, Boy Dominic, I Claudius, 115 episodes of Z Cars, Doctor Who in 1986, The Kenny Everett Show, Phantom Menace, Family Guy, Doctors, Wizards vs. Aliens, Henry Huggle Monster, Peppa Pig, Flash Gordon and Henry VIII. If you need a booming voice, who else do you go to? A national treasure against whom nothing has yet been proved. <laughs> he attempted to climb Everest three times. <laughs> How far did he get? I don't know. <laughs> I think attempting to climb it is a, a, a euphemistic way of saying he failed to, to climb Everest <laughs> three times. But he is the oldest person to have reached the geographical and magnetic North Poles. He also completed cosmonaut training. Really? Yeah. And at 14, he met Picasso, who drew a, a picture of a dove for him, which he refused and instead drew something for the artist. Oh, well. <laughs> yeah, had his that's, pension gone. That's exactly right, yeah. This might mean something to you. He was suggested as Admiral Doherty by Patrick Stewart for a Star Trek or Insurrection. Okay. But that went to Anthony Zerba. Do you remember him? His name rings the bell. Well, yes. He's in Colombo, isn't he? He was. He played Max in the guillotine. Right. He was a victim. Yes. And Blessed has also often been linked to the role of Doctor Who, who he says he would love to play. I think he's obviously too old for it now. Yeah, I don't think he's in the best of health either. He had some issues recently. Mm. Apparently he sparred with the Dalai Lama. <laughs> <laughs> Literally sparring. Yes, I don't think it was verbal sparring. I think it was <laughs> fisticuffs. Oh dear. <laughs> wonder who started that. <laughs> yes. Peter Benson played Henry Tudor, born in 1943. You may have seen him in Casualty, Heartbeat, The Bill, Albion Market, Doctor Who. The first, second and third part of King Henry the Sixth and Great Expectations. Okay. Got anything for us? Well, the problem is, I think we did a lot of the trivia for season one when we covered season two, and it's not hmm. much point going back over. But like you said at the top, there was some pretty obvious lavish spending on this episode, wasn't there? Yeah, I don't think it works. I don't think it adds anything no. to the show. Well, yeah, but we're saying that knowing that mm. it's good when they, they downsize it. Yeah, true. Apparently many of Peter Cook's lines were improvised. I don't think, even at this stage in his life, if he was the most... I think it's unfair to say reliable, because uh, I'm not saying he was unprofessional, but I think he still, his lifestyle still um, led to him being more of a improviser, shall we say. Right. I read something, I think he'd done a radio show with Chris Morris, who'd expect him to turn up and be incoherent, but instead he was, he said he was one of the sharpest improvisers that he'd come across. Without a doubt, yeah, I can believe yeah. that. Next time, we have Born to be King. Well, I guess we'll see folk in a couple of weeks. Well, indeed. Until then, cheerio. Bye bye.